Welcome back. Well, Belgium's ongoing political stalemate begs the question, what is the future for the country? Some fear that the country may go the way of Czechoslovakia and split into two separate states, a wealthier Flemish state in the north with a francophone state in the south. Yet many don't see this as a realistic outcome. Polls suggest that 70% of Belgians are opposed to a split. It's more likely that Belgium will eventually forge a new constitutional arrangement. Well, Belgium isn't the only country struggling with its identity. Ethnic and linguistic divisions are found across Europe. ETA is an organization fighting for an independent homeland in the Basque region of Spain. Their violent campaign has claimed around 800 lives in the last 40 years. Similarly, Corsica, a part of France, has also seen conflict as it seeks independence. Kosovo awaits a December the 10th deadline to see whether they can break away from Serbia. But not all divisions have seen violence. In the UK, Scotland set up its own parliament in 1999. Wales is also home to a small independence movement. Well, back on the continent, Romania hosts a large Hungarian minority, and Italy has long been defined by its strong north-south divide. Well, joining us again are guests from Brussels, Marco Martinello, a political science professor at the University of Liège, Stefan Fier, Assistant Professor of Comparative Politics at the Catholic University of Louvain, and Caroline Segesseur, a political analyst at CRISP, a socio-political research institute in Brussels. Um, Stefan Fier, let me come to you first, if I may. Many observers say that the only thing keeping Belgium from breaking apart is the realization that it would be extremely difficult to do this. Would you agree with that? Well, obviously, this is one of the main uh, things, uh, one, one, one of the main problems in having this scenario or some people try to, to design a scenario in which a split would be possible. But obviously, a lot of things have already been split because we have to see the, the federal government is a kind of umbrella. But under that umbrella, we have the, the regions and the regions have become, um, as the time being, have become more and more important. Uh, especially in daily lives of people. It's the regions and the communities who regulate education, a lot of, mobil uh, of mobility, of traffic, of economy, um, etc., and social health care. And only at the federal level are only a number of, a, n a limited number, excuse me, a limited number of issues which are still uh, jointly um, decided upon by the French speaking and by the, the Flemish speaking regions. Um, and, and that's one of the, one of the main uh, things. Um, as Marco has said earlier in, the, in, the, um, in, this, in this program, um, a lot of the things are, are basically we are living separate from each other. We are, we are living in our own worlds. As I'm watching the Flemish television, there's, on, uh, there's hardly any broadcasting on the French-speaking uh, region. And if there is any broadcasting, it is in stereotypes, as Marco has said earlier in the program. And so basically the two communities live separately and there is only a limited number of issues that we try to do uh, together. Caroline Seger, sir, let me bring you back in here. Is there a sense that perhaps a new form of Belgian federalism has to be now invented, one that fosters growth uh, and progress in both language communities? Well, probably if we agree that we want to go on forming a single state Belgium, we need to redefine the conditions of our living together. But the Belgian federal state is a, a state that is continuously under reform. I mean, we started the first step of federalism was taken in 1970. And since then, there have been several institutional reforms. Uh, it's not like a, a revolution is about to take place. We are just going on with the process of state reform, as we've done in the past. Um, Stefan Fiers, let me come back to you. Uh, there had been speculation that the outgoing prime minister would lead an emergency government, but it's now more likely that he'll bring both sides back to the, back to the table to have talks again. Is that likely to happen? Well, um, in his statement yesterday, he made it very clear that he, uh, he's going for a two-track policy. One of the tracks is definitely try to see whether the current, um, 
the current government, who is just a caretaking a government, whether they could take new initiatives and, for instance, make a budget for the next year. We're almost at the at the uh, uh, at the end of the year, and we need a budget for for 2008. So, at the, uh, constitutionally speaking, this is not possible for the moment. So he's now trying to extend the possibilities for the caretaking government to introduce a budget, to take some measures and, uh, and urgent measures because um, the image of the country is, is at risk. And at the second track, he's trying to gather, um, gather all the political parties, probably all the democratic political parties, to make, a, uh, to make some uh, uh, propositions, proposals on a uh, future reform of the state. But this is something which will be very, very delicate. And uh, he made it, it very clear yesterday that he was very hesitant to take this initiative because obviously, uh, as all the political parties are in a, in a deadlock situation and all the political parties have made uh, large um, statements in the press, uh, it's also it's also possible that they will lose their image in the at the, in in the electorate, and this is something that uh, they obviously would like to um, uh, would not like to happen. Marco Martiniello, let me bring you back here. The other obstacle, of course, is the capital Brussels. It's a francophone enclave uh, in Flemish territory. I mean, is it likely that the capital would defy any political or cultural divorce? Do you think? Well, you know, Brussels is a multicultural city, it is an international city, and basically we have to realize that without Brussels, the other regions and community will be much poorer. So this is really uh, uh, an important challenge uh, for Flanders, for Wallonia, to keep uh, close links with Brussels. And therefore, uh, you know, what I do not see, and we were making the comparisons with other countries, you know, this is a very, very peaceful country. I don't see violence getting in. But clearly, uh, in Brussels, people should start thinking about, you know, more autonomy for the region of Brussels as well. Because Brussels has its specific identity, its specific positions, and it should also be more recognized as an autonomous region within uh, the Belgian new federal state. And I think there will be a solution in the, in the short term. Stefan Fier, some analysts say a strong, united Belgium is still important to Britain and the EU. Would you agree with that? Yes, obviously. Um, I think it's, um, the image of the country has, uh, has, um, uh, well, has, has suffered a lot from this uh, institutional crisis that we, that we have for the moment. And it's uh, very clear that, um, uh, for instance, Br as Belgium has Brussels as being the, the capital of Europe, um, it, it, it's one of the, of the strong points of Belgium for the moment. And uh, it would be very sad for the city of Brussels if, for instance, um, we, we, we're going into all kinds of new scenarios where Brussels will be um, uh, separate from the rest of the country, where Flanders or French-speaking countries, uh, French-speaking region, um, will will deal in a different way with Brussels. And Brussels definitely, as for the image of Europe, for the image of the country, this is, it's very important that we find a solution from this political crisis very soon. Caroline Segesier, should other nations and the wider Europe uh, really care about what happens in Belgium? Well, I'm not sure that other nations uh, do care so much, but it is possible that inside the European Union, some of the countries would be very worried to see Belgium split because, as you mentioned, I think at another point, there are other autonomous uh, movements in, in, uh, in Europe, in France, in Spain and elsewhere, and they would be very afraid that the splitting up of Belgium would set uh, a precedent for other countries. So I'm sure that they are anxious to prevent this from happening. Stefan Fuhr, a final thought from you before we go. How much political will is there to reach a compromise for the future? Will both sides have to compromise more to break this political deadlock? Well, it's obvious that um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, all political parties have uh, made some big statements in the press and that um, the, well, the, at the heat of the, of the fight, 
um, that all kinds of declarations have been made which were detrimental to, to find a solution. Now that the crisis is at its height, I think that it's very clear for all political parties that they should soften the tone, which means that the Flemish political parties um, should look for or claim less autonomy, or if they want more autonomy for their region, that at least they are willing to give something in return to the French-speaking political uh, parties. This is the basic of a co compromise. This is the basic of our coalition governments, which have been there for uh, more than 100 years. And uh, it's typical for a consensus democracy that we only will find a solution if we find a compromise. And a compromise means that both sides have to pour some water in the wine and uh, try to find a, um, a agreement and reach a hand to each other. OK, we have to leave it there. Stefan Fuhr, Marco Martiniello and Caroline Segesier, thank you very much indeed all for joining us. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and your suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From the whole team here, goodbye for now. <laughs>